Right, ladies and gentlemen, do make yourselves at home and comfortable if you can. You'll have seen I'm a moderator who cuts things very fine time-wise. I was still having my lunch and I'd lost track of time, but it's wonderful to be here. Thank you all for joining this panel discussion. I don't know if many of you caught our panel this morning um, on the big privacy issues. Uh, I think some, there's some overlap with what we're going to talk uh, about over the next hour and a quarter. But I think we're going to focus and drill down more on um, the phenomenon known as big data. That really is at the heart of what we're talking about um, this afternoon. I think the, the tagline for our, our session is big data taking privacy and data protection seriously. Um, so I want to start by introducing the panel and just in a sense, exploring more about this idea of big data, what it means, um, and where it is taking us. Uh, to do that, we have got a, a fantastic panel, and I'll introduce uh, you to them right now. Now, I haven't met all of the panel before, so I'm going to do it uh, by taking the most obvious Malavika first, because gender-wise, that's very straightforward. Malavika Jairam is... Um, Fellow of the Berkman Center for Internet and Security at Harvard University, um, and the CIS. What's CIS stand for? In Center Bangalore? for Internet and Society. In Bangalore, in India. India. Yeah. yeah. So welcome to you, Malavika. Now, uh, David uh, Motanda is from Google, and David, I welcome you to the panel. I very disrespectfully said I'm going to see the internet, the Google bloke, <laughs> in my panel this morning, and here is the Google bloke. And for those of you who don't know the <laughs> The English word bloke, uh, it isn't the politest term, but it is a friendly term for uh, a gentleman who has very gracefully accepted the chance to be on a panel and to discuss big data from the point of view of uh, Google, one of the greatest collectors of data, personal data in the world today. So, uh, David, it's great to have you on board. Now, you two I haven't met before, but I think I can, by a process of elimination, uh, perhaps work out who is who. So Kamal uh, no. Bhattacharya. No. No? no. no. Uh, oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm Gus Hossein from Privacy is Dead International. You're Gus. <laughs> I'm so sorry. So you're Gus from <laughs> Privacy International. <laughs> and where is Kamal then? We don't have a Kamal. <laughs> uh, and, and Bill Hoffman. Bill Hoffman. Hoffman. Bill, I'm so sorry. I, my list of panelists is clearly not quite up to date. But um, Gus is Executive Director of Privacy International. And Bill, you are? With the World Economic Forum. With the World Economic Forum. Terrific. And with a particular interest in sure, internet? I uh, lead an initiative on big data and personal data and how to strike that balance. Terrific. Well, there you go. We have got a panel which is absolutely suited to the task of discussing big data. So let's um, kick off by asking all of you in turn whether you feel we should be inclined to be extraordinarily wary of this concept of big data and the idea that uh, actually big data is sort of taking over our culture, our society, our lives. Let's start with you, Malavika. I think I'm more worried about um, the hype and the hubris around big data than big data itself. Um, I think the things it's projected to do or not do are problematic, and I think people often mistake big data for big knowledge or big insights, which I think sort of extends what it can do. And um, I think we often ignore the people behind the data and the fact that big data can lead to big bias or that in doing so, I mean, I'm pulling out all the cliches here, but um, that you ignore the small lives, and I say that in a humane sense rather than a pejorative sense, that big data affects small lives disproportionately. But maybe we should define it. I mean, I, I come at this as a layman, and I'm aware of, not least because of everything that came out of uh, Snowden and Glenn Greenwald and the discussion of, of, uh, of whether much of what we now know of what was being gathered and collated by US uh, intelligence services, NSA, etc., whether it was dangerous, because their argument was, well, actually, it's not dangerous, because so much of it is just amorphous, anonymized big data that no individual need worry about what we are seeing and collecting. So does that make sense to you? How would you define big data? 
I think big. I think someone described it very well, saying big data is when it's just big enough to make you a little uncomfortable. Hmm. I think that's a great definition. And I actually don't want to focus just on surveillance. I think big data goes way sure. beyond. It's the more banal uses of it in the private sector, in government that go beyond the NSA and Snowden that I think affect people's daily lives in a much more tangible uh, way. And I think that. Well, I agree. I don't want to just talk about um, the surveillance state and, and that aspect of big data either. And maybe it's good at this point then to move on to you, David. And, and you sit here as Google's man on the panel. How would you define big data? First of all, I would say I don't think we should approach it with great wary, but rather with great interest. Because big data is... It is Big data is an unfortunate word because it, it sort of links your brain to big oil and big tobacco. It's better to talk about data-driven innovation because what we now have is a great possibility to match large sets of data and understand new things, things that we haven't understood before. And that is a good possibility. I mean, I, I, and, and I'm saying this because I think we need to see that as a starting point. There are challenges, challenges along the road. but. Start off with trying to understand, is big data or data-driven innovation something that could deliver anything good? And the answer to that is yes. And, and then we can address the problems. And give me some four examples of, of the beneficial, positive aspects of big data. Well, the possibility to match large sets of data on, for example, health and medicine will gain new understandings of how we humans work and we will be equipped with new tools of addressing sicknesses across the world. I mean, just as one example. There are obvious privacy concerns with that, as there are many examples in different countries. But the baseline is that it gives us a new opportunity. Yeah, it seems to me there's a, a fundamental problem from the get-go with big data in that it, it, it's derived from just enormous, unimaginably large amounts of small data that is put together. But in that transition from the individual to the vast collective, the individual loses any sense of accountability, ownership, control over what was in the beginning theirs and which then becomes part of something so enormous they have absolutely no stake or sense of stake or control in it at all. And that's worrying, isn't it? Well, that is the route we have to take. I mean, it's, it's a matter of creating trust. I mean, I'm thinking a bit about that when I listened to the panel before lunch, that the basic foundation for the internet is that people trust the internet. Unless they don't, unless they trust, don't trust it, they will not use it. So the, the, the idea is that... Well, that's you, not... Obviously, that's, you'll have that to can't be true. Trust. People, increasingly, we know, do not trust the internet, but they still use it And that is a great challenge for the internet and for, for those of us who believe in the internet to restore that trust. I mean, the debate before lunch was a clear signal that there is mistrust. And, th and that is very serious. And that can't have come as a surprise to you. No, not at all. I mean, we, <laughs> believe me, we work... The issue of trust is core for everything we do, and not only in my company, I would guess in all internet companies. Mm. But going back to the issue of big data, yes, we need to find a path which makes it... creates a security for those who, are, who contribute with data to the big data sets. And that is one of the challenges. But don't forget that we start from a position where it can do good if All we right. find the right path. Well, I want to pick away at that some more, but I want to bring Gus in at this point. So, Gus, same thing for you, really, as, a, as an opener. Give me your definition of big data and whether you think the word I set out with, which was a, a awareness of it, mm. is, is, is the right sort of sentiment to approach it with. Yeah, th there's a number of reasons to be wary of it, but the, the definition I think that is least controversial is that there is wisdom within data that if you have enough data, wisdom will emerge. Uh, the problem is that we're, we're putting a lot of confidence in the data, as if the data is itself wise. And aggr aggregated, it becomes even more wise. But if you look at all the examples of where we've had semi-big data to date, whether it is um, trying to identify terrorists amongst large mm. populations by the way people behave, or trying to identify who um, is worthy of credit and who isn't worthy of credit. You always get people discriminated, on, um, discriminated by credit agencies because of erroneous data. Those types of problems have always arisen where we think that we can make decisions about people based on how other people behave or uh, based on 
uh, large data sets that are unrelated to that actual individual. So that's the worrying aspect of, of big data, where we think that because in order to solve complex social problems, all we need to do is collect more data. But maybe it does sort of work, it's just not foolproof. And maybe you're a guy who's minded just to focus on the yeah, cases absolutely. where it goes wrong and, yeah. and, and forget about all of the cases where it's actually helpful and goes right. I think that's a very interesting point. I think um, there are places in society where we can use it where errors will not result in loss of life or loss of access to services right. or uh, loss of, or discrimination by, say, law enforcement. But where do you see the, the largest amount of investment in big data? There's always these examples given of the beneficent use of big data for health research. And you know, there, there's a point to be made there. But where the greatest amount of interest right now is in security. <laughs> You know, smart cities being able to identify criminal activity or not even criminal activity, suspicious activity in advance. It is, it is the powerful institutions who want to gather this data and start using it. So that's where the emphasis is going to be. It's not going to be on these, these you know, make everybody happy, make the world a better and happier place. It'll be who can we identify, what have they done wrong, um, how can we segment. Well, except I, I, as far as I was aware, again, as a layman not as steeped in this as you guys, one of the areas I was aware that big data was, was being used uh, and applied most um, sort of uh, comprehensively was in healthcare, I thought, mm -hmm. and in disease tracking and that sort of thing. And isn't that an extraordinarily useful public good? It's health research actually is done very carefully. It's done based on data sets, but done by scientists and statisticians. Big data abandons that statistical approach. It abandons that clear, methodological, careful approach. And instead just says, to hell with it, let's just get as much data as possible. We don't really care about where it comes from, just get more and more and more and more. And eventually, because it's so massive, mm. we'll be able to identify something. Versus very careful research done by universities and, and pharmaceutical companies. That's a very different type of activity. Okay. Bill, um, same thing as an opener. Just give us your, your, your perspective on it, your definition of it, and the degree of skepticism with which you approach this big data phenomenon. Okay, a couple questions there. So I guess my definition would uh, lean or stand on the shoulders of Lawrence Lessig that said data is a verb, not a noun, and that it's a process flow. It's the flow of data that's hit unprecedented scale and is touching people that have never... Uh, been included before. And so I'd also view it as an opportunity that we can redefine uh, process flows, uh, discover new insights, and it works at multiple scales, uh, down to everybody's genome, to our grandest social organizations, um, to our climate. And so I think the challenge is one of balance. At the end of the day, this is up to us to decide how we use it. And there's tremendous new power asymmetries. Um, in a hyper-connected world, you don't get a normal distribution of power. You have 5,000-foot giants giants and a very, very long tail. And I don't think our institutions were designed to address that class of power at this intimate level of scale. And so I think we're in this process of walking through the complexity. And as we mentioned earlier in the day, what are some of the new governance structures? What are some of the ways that we can collectively align on shared principles and uphold them and enforce them? Um, we don't have the means right now to effectively monitor and audit how data is used in all the infinite varieties that we can, and so I think that's a structural challenge. Mm. Um, Thank you for that opener. I I'm also should say to everybody, uh, the, the uh, curators of the Twitter feed and uh, sort of digital interaction are with us too, and so I'm going to turn to them from time to time to see what's going on, if anything's going on. Do wave your arms in the air if, <laughs> if there's passionate debate been sparked or if, if people are saying, because we've got the feed here actually, so we can also see what people are saying. Uh, I suspect that at an event like this, there is a, a, a great degree of, of um, concern about where big data is going, and, and not least how big big data is going to become. Because it seems to me, you know, the more we uh, talk about the Internet of Things, for example, and the more we get sort of real-time feeds of, of information on all of us all the time, everything we do, who we speak to, what we do in our lives, put into a digital form, 
uh, the more the size of big data becomes almost unimaginable. Am I right or am I going too far? Well, that's certainly the direction of things. I think there are two futures we can talk about when it comes to Internet of Things. There's one that the big data proponents want, which is sensors everywhere. Yeah. Sensors everywhere that detect us and then transmit information. Reporting immediately, immediately back to... Exactly. Yeah. So my fridge will be on the internet. Yeah. My microwave will be on the, in on the internet. Uh, and importantly, it'll be constantly communicating with Google and constantly communicating with my electricity company. Oh. And constantly, like, I would have no control over it. So that's one view of the future. And with that comes big data and wonderful marketing opportunities. And that's really about it. Then there's the alternative view, which is, yes, these devices can all be connected, but not connected to some immediately outside world, but under my control, where I can connect all the devices in my home and I can know if there's enough milk in the fridge. I don't need to notify the grocery store or notify Google that there's enough milk in the fridge. I, can, like, I will be in control of devices. I will be in control of the information. And then from there, I can determine what happens. But the big data people want to make sure that that localized control doesn't exist and that everything's transmitting and detecting all the time. Right, David, you're a big data person. So come on, is that yeah. what you want? No, I think that is painting the world very black and white, to be honest. I, th I, think, I think there is a future where we will be able to use the technique in, in a lot of aspects. But I do think that that doesn't necessarily rule out the possibility to live with an old refrigerator as well. So no, no, no. Nobody, I think nobody's saying a few old fridges won't survive, but, but what Gus is saying is that you don't, you don't want the information controlled by, by individuals. You want the information pretty much automatically to be uploaded into a vast collated set which people like you can then use for your own ends, your own profit-making ends. Um, I don't agree with that. I mean, the more and more information yeah. you have, the better, basically. And you want more and more of this stuff. Well, I, I think if you, if, you, if you look at the Google products that we, the, the we provide, uh, there is a set of tools that are in place to give the users control, to create transparency, to, to, to as far as possible, try to describe what we do, how we do it, and why we do it. There is also controls which gives the users a possibility to, to switch back buttons back and forth. And then thirdly, there's a possibility to, to take what we have about you and leave as a sort of the ultimate resort. And that is, that is trying to create a user control, a user understanding besides transparency. And I think in the future, if we talk about a data-driven innovation future, then, then we will see similar controls in place. I'm not saying they're perfect because not everybody are even aware that they are no, there. Uh, but, but, but let's face it, huge numbers of people who use that is Google are not aware of the fact that over the last year or two mm -hmm. or three, you've obviously felt pressure to be more responsive to those who say, you know, users need more control, they need more ability to opt out, to, to refuse to... Either felt a need to be responsive or shared a view that this is quite a good way to go. And I'm not saying that we're there yet, but this is a path that we are pushing it and trying to do, a, do as good as we can. We haven't even seen the beginning of the beginning yet, I think. We, I think we will see this develop. Because it, it no, we just think we lost your mic. Uh, Keep talking. I think I'm back. No, I'm it goes back to that which I started tried to start with, that this is one way in which we can try to create trust in what we do. Let's use an example, actually, that, that helps Google out just a little bit. So I have a Google phone. And by using a Google phone, uh, by default, it's set up so that it transmits location information to Google. I can opt out of that, and so it gives me an element of control, which is good. How like, easy is it to opt out? It's a bit of a pain and keep it... it it's not as well designed as it could be, but I give them the benefit of the doubt. They're trying to do something there, but they would far prefer if the default was that all information was going to Google. Yeah. But that's where you have control. Nonetheless, this device is communicating with telephone companies, and telephone companies are by default getting location information. Mm -hmm. They're not asking for it. It's just part of the provision of service. And now telephone companies are saying, hey, we can be like Google too. The way that Google takes information and makes further use of it, why don't we do that as telephone companies? So you see O2, you see all those major telephone companies saying, yes, we can take all this data that customers have no choice but to give us, give us, and we can then analyze that and decide how are people moving about a city? 
how is so-and-so moving about a city and how is that different from so-and-so? And so these t um, telephone companies are now getting into the smart cities business, which is selling big data to cities, selling that data to other companies, but also introducing the security aspect of who's gathering in this part of town when they shouldn't be gathering in this part of town and profiling people mm. as a result. I think what's also dangerous is those instances where you're not voluntarily giving up that data, where it's compulsorily taken from you for a passport, for an identity scheme, uh, under a census. So those sorts of big data and the large those databases. Those state, state-driven. State-driven, yeah. Mm -hmm. State-driven ones where they're conditions of access, where they're platforms that mediate relationships between a citizen and a state, where you don't have an opt-out. You don't have the option of saying, I will not participate in your census. You can, but you could go to jail. But which what, is are you suggesting that what, census information shouldn't be digitized? No, or? what I'm saying is that the concept of ownership and control and the ability to have default or non-default opt-in mm. and opt-out becomes very difficult and compromised when you're dealing with data that you don't have any agency over. You don't have an option to say, I will participate in an ID scheme or I will participate in a census. So when the kinds of data that you give to Google um, is combined with data that's already out there, in a compulsory paradigm. Right. That causes all kinds of linkages that are difficult, but also just the big databases themselves when there are moves to make all of this open. So the open data movement is all about pushing data out, which is great. There are a lot of societal benefits that can come out of it, but when it's not done sensitive, sensitively, when it's not done with looking at privacy and security considerations, when it's not anonymized, when unnecessary information is out there on the internet, I think big data then you know, raises all kinds of other issues. Can you think of any current examples where um, the, as you say, the mandatory handing over of, of personal information for census or other forms of national ID scheme or whatever, where that, there's been a clear crossover between that sort of information and, and privately gathered information yeah, in a way has. that could be damaging to individuals' privacy. I mean, give me an example. So, for example, in India, which is the area I know best, mm. we've had a lot of examples where when they wanted to verify people's identity under our national population register, they posted, and even for the elections, they posted everybody's data very publicly in schools and other private fora, saying, come and check that this is all right. But they posted all of the fields of data that was very sensitive, people's addresses, date of birth, you know, all kinds of other invasive information for people to come and verify. So they could have had a way of doing it that was anonymized, that was only accessible to the individual concerned, but they just posted everything out there for people to see. Another example is we have something called a National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, um, and again, that's something that's supposed to provide a minimum amount of work mm. to people who need jobs. And again, all of this data was very indiscriminately put out there, saying this is how much somebody earned. And then you had people sort of, you know, competitively... Um, treating each other based on income levels and saying, oh, why did this guy make so much? So there are very, I mean, Norway has done it with publicizing tax information, and that was sort of scaled back. So there are many instances where information that is collected in a particular context then sort of bleeds over into other uses, and then private firms, private marketers use all of that data that's publicly available thinking that they're then free to remix and reuse. Right. Um, and the user doesn't know any of it is being done and has absolutely no ability to control flow, as Bill was saying. Yeah, just to build on that, I think one of the things that I've heard in a number of conversations like that is the uh, locus of control um, as we evolve needs to go much more from the collection of data, uh, which is largely becoming impossible to stop. If we tried to see how many bits are being generated right here in this room, the number of sensors, the microphones, the lights, and if we all tried to individually give some type of consent for how this particular session mm -hmm. is going, we would spend the rest of the conference <coughs> going through consent decrees. So I think, at least from a, a, a sustainable future, if you look towards the context of a given usage and how that's being governed, and then where we really need some innovation is how do you effectively engage individuals either as me as an individual or as an ecosystem that's acting on my behalf, I think then you start to get some structural ways of saying, okay, this is a, a, a way that we could have some balance. One of the uh, things that we've heard in terms of a, of a new lens, of a different perspective, is if we could shift away from user-centric, which ends up putting all the risk, all the, the duties and responsibilities on the shoulders of the individual. I have to go and, and monitor things 
towards a more user-centered elements where institutions, governments are looking at the use and the risk through the eyes of the individual, then I think we can start to rebalance things and, and be much more what I'll call human-centered and principle-based because institutionally there's some accountability, there's a price to be paid if you um, didn't adhere towards your terms of service. Mm. Um, the other little soundbite that you hear a lot is we're all on the wrong side of a one-way mirror when it comes to data. And I think these information differentials, these asymmetries of power, there are tremendous incentives to keep them in place. And until we really start to, as individuals, start to raise our hands and say, well, wait a second, how come others can't act on my behalf in a trusted and accountable fashion, then I think we'll start to see systemically a little more trust and accountability in the marketplace. Um, we need smart data, right? So the permissions and providence can flow with the data. And we need smart contracts, right? So that on a given usage that we can leverage contract law for what are the rights, human rights, but what are the duties? Because without the rights, I mean, without the duties, right, we'll just be waving our arms around about what we should or shouldn't do with the data. So I think contract law really becomes an interesting uh, combustion engine of where we can start to make some progress. All right, okay. Well, I, I'll tell you what, um, I'm just seeing the screen as well as listening to you, Bill, and. Uh, we're going to get questions from all of you, I hope, uh, and I'm going to throw that open. Oh, goodness, you just scrolled down, and I've just... There was a question that I just wanted to put out there. Can we scroll back up the stream a little bit? Go the other way. Go, go, you know, go, yeah, go, just lift it up a bit. There you go. Question for panel. Uh, how do you see differences in interactions between big data and open data? Well, you've sort of touched on this already, but we, we're all very positive about open data. We think it's great. It, it, it gives us all a sense that we're more informed, better informed, about our institutions, about the way that our world works. Uh, but then we start worrying about big data. So uh, maybe we all need to sort of open our minds to big data and not see it as so threatening. If, if I may, um, the two worlds should be kept very far apart. Open data, for the most part, almost entirely does not focus on personal information. It's about getting information out of government or closed systems where we as, uh, as citizens, we as people who could make use of information for our own betterment right. should be given access. And so it's, so it's like accountability. It's data. an accountability mechanism, yeah. absolutely. Um, the people who confuse open data and big data is, be, is because they see all the goodwill around open data and they want to see that bleed into big data so they can profit off it. Right. Um, and so the fact that it's being raised in this question, this happens all the time, this confusion. And it's very intentional. I'm not saying the person asking no, the question. No, because the person was actually so. saying what absolutely. kind of interactions can there and be? And so what I would like to see around big data is that intent around open data which is that we need to be transparent and accountable. I would love to see that th th those motivations applied to the big data world. But unfortunately, the big data world is a hidden world. You don't even know that you've your information is in the big data processing that's going on. You don't even know who is the institution that is processing the information. All you see is the final result of, can I board an airplane or can I not? Can I buy this phone or can I not? Can I get a bank account or can I not? You have no knowledge over the institutions, the powers that be, and the data that's being used to make decisions about you. So take that open data sentiment, apply it to the big data world, and we might have a better world. Right, the and therefore Google stands accused of being part of a closed system. You like you, you know, you think that you can use the data to maximize um, the good you can offer in individuals' lives, but but the way you do it is entirely closed to those individuals. I don't agree with that. I'm sorry, I've said this a couple of times now uh, to your <laughs> questions. Uh, I, I, I don't even agree with that definition of big data. I mean, to me, big data is the possibility to match large sets of data against each other at a low cost, quickly. That, to me, is big data. I think what you're talking about is how do we use big amounts of data that are gathered in different places, and I think you're also saying that Google has that amount of data. I still claim that we are, first of all, data gathered by a sensor in your home can provide a good service. I, I, I reiterate that, that there are good things with this as well. But I also feel that we need to secure that there are choices, transparency, and insight in what's happening. You would accept that, so, that the individual needs to have a much greater sense of um, 
involve engagement with knowledge of uh, understanding of the process by which information from him or her is going to you and being used by you? Because right now, most people do not really understand that. By the way you post that question, I understand you have a second question up your sleep, but I'm still going to walk right in the trap and say, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I do. I mean, I, I, I do think that we need get people to understand what is happening on the internet because that creates trust. And in the long run, that trust is absolutely vital. Now, I am very open to criticism that my company is not doing enough. But believe me when I say we're trying to do more. But yes, I would agree that we need and, to get... And you see all of us as, as commodity. I mean, we are useful to you because the more you know about us, the more you can profit from that knowledge. And I just wonder whether, you, the more that becomes clear to the individual, is there not a danger that the individual is gonna rebel and is gonna want to not actually be commodified in the way that you want to commodify us? I would not phrase it that way. Well, I suspect you wouldn't, I would, I would, but, but I would what, say, what's um, actually wrong with the way I've phrased well, it? Well, I, I, I would say that in the, in the world of Internet of Things <coughs> and in, in the digitized future, Data will be able to be used to provide good services. That will require that we share data in order to get that return service. Now, in some cases, there is a commodity discussion on top of that. But the basic foundation is that there are services which are good that require data. That's where I would start if, if mm. I were to discuss about it. So I wouldn't run directly into the sort of, you are just a commodity on, on the shelf of, of, of the big corporation Google. No, I can see why you wouldn't, but it, I, you haven't convinced me that it's not true. <laughs> it, 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 I'm, I'm not sure I will be able to do that during the last 40 <laughs> minutes, but uh, I'm happy to try. Well, <laughs> Gus, what were you going to say? Then I'm going to throw the, it um, It's the difference again between the open and the, and the big, where um, the empowering notion behind open data is that intelligence can be shared. Big data is about... Uh, the institutions who have access to the, to the data holding on to the intelligence. Um, and so Google will never, and it, Google's not necessarily the worst actor. No, it just so place, happens that David's from Google, yeah, so we're absolutely. talking about Google perhaps more than... Google uh, will yeah. never share with you the wisdom of what it is they do with their information, how they do it, but they will sell nonetheless as a result of the intelligence they've gleaned from your mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. I think the problem also is it's not just the pieces of data, it's the algorithms that might embed certain biases or certain ways of looking at the world, which is never made transparent. Which we don't know. Exactly. Yeah. So even if you push the data out there, and even if Google tells us what it collects, um, it doesn't necessarily tell us how it makes those correlations, which then lead to causation, and uh, one is mistaken for the other. So I think when decision-making gets automated or when extrapolations occur and inferences are made, we don't know how that's done. That's a black box. Right, so I think and it could be based upon unfair prejudices or yeah. a right. whole set of uh, attitudes which many folks would regard as unfair or unacceptable. Yeah. yeah. So, and so we I think this know. notion of um, collectively how can we open up our new black boxes in a manner that protects the proprietary interests of those that have invested in it um, allows the transparency not to let the system be gamed, right? Because once you figure it out, then all of a sudden you can start to game the algorithms. But you also need to ask the questions of what data hasn't been included? Who's being excluded? Um, is it valid? And so I think there's an array of um, smart questions to ask coming from some interesting academics. Um, shameless plug here, we just issued a report that starts to lay those out. But I think this notion of looking at the world, not about the data, but about the algorithms who has access to them, the control of those algorithms are generally with large actors, governments, and private sector, and how do we get those capacities, that oversight, um, not to place judgments, but to have some general questions of are they principle-based, are they fair, um, are they accurate? Mm. Um, and that's big math. That's, I don't think anybody really has that one figured out yet, but I think that's a really important question to start asking. Okay, well, I'm gonna open it up now to everybody here. Um, you know, we've, we've started out a discussion on big data and we've talked about wariness of and we've talked about the difference between open data and big data. I'd just love some input now from you guys as, as to where you all as users 
of the internet and, and witting or unwitting providers of those little blocks that go into big data, how you feel about it. Go on. Um, hello, I'm, I'm Wojciech, I'm a journalist from, from Poland. Uh, I just wanted to ask a question uh, primarily to David from, from, from Google. Um, because I, I see the problem of user trust uh, into big data as a kind of catch-22, a situation with no, no, no real solution. Because on one hand, Google, Google can never reveal the way it, it's processing data. It cannot be ever completely transparent because, I mean, as much as I hate to be Google's advocate, I must admit that there's a legitimate reason uh, Google cannot reveal it because that's the trade secret. It's like forcing Coca-Cola to give up the recipe for Coke. You, you can never do that because that's, that's, this is your secret, what you do with, with, with data. But on the other hand, as long as you don't do that, I will never trust you because <laughs> I don't know what you do. So, so is there any, any one of you, any, any panelist, do you see any way out of this Cash 22? Or maybe I'm wrong and maybe it doesn't exist, it's just my own paranoia. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, well, if so, I'm paranoid too because I think it's a great question. So who wants to respond to it? Well, you might as well because you're Mr. Google for the purposes of this discussion. Uh, I, th I, th I think, first of all, and here I can only talk for my company, we don't sell information to others. So the information that is collected when you use the Google products are used for providing Google products and not sold to anyone else. And as I said, you will always have the possibility to take that information with you and leave us. And this is, this is maybe, maybe basic bricks in what needs to be built. But we will need to have a debate along, along the way in the coming years, very much like, like you described, in how do we address this. Uh, and, and from that debate, maybe we can win back the trust. Do you, do, you, do you accept that the, the, the trust has become a, a bigger and bigger issue for you? I mean, you, you, you yes. have lost a lot of trust. Uh, and people are much more wary now about what it means to be part of the Google experience? I'm not sure that is such a bad idea, to be a bad thing either, to be honest, because the, the fact that people are beginning to question is exactly that sort of intellectual resistance that is needed in order to get real trust, long-term long trust. We, we have pages where you as a user can get insight in what we do with your data. Very few use them. Very few are interested. So if events like this can stir up a debate about trust and, and, and privacy and actually get interest, get people more interested, I think we would all be better off. Mm. Can I just add to that? I mean, turning it around, what you were saying, if you're not actually selling the data technically, but you're still in a position where you link and track and profile and advertise to people based on the information mm. that you hold, that puts you in an even bigger monopolistic position that actually puts even more power in your hands than if you were actually sharing the data with other people. So I don't know if that's a good thing. Uh, well, it, it's good from the perspective that the data is kept in one place and not shared with anyone else because that gives you as a user the possibility to take it with you and leave. That would not be possible if we had sold it to other people. So in, The in balance one way, of power doesn't work very well when it's me against Google. Well, we are, we are tr trying to provide you with, with the tools to actually empower you. I don't you. want to spend my entire life navigating privacy policies. I want the default setting to be privacy preserving. Yeah, well, well, that's, uh, I think a lot of people and are I mean, say I the same thing. Some level why do the you idea make it? Of, it I think the idea of consent is also broken. I mean, yeah. there are legal well, researchers who've written about this where you can't consent to something you, because you can never future-proof users of your data. I'm consenting to something based on information I have now. Mm. I'm expected to make a privacy bargain or a trade-off based on information that's available to me now. Mm. I can't future-proof it, yet the consent that I give is used for every iteration yeah, of you a don't, privacy you don't policy seek forever and ever. You, know, you don't come back to us every sort of six months because deemed to have actually consented. you've found incredibly creative new ways to oh, we, use we all information we, from us. We, we did a you rather post big a new review. privacy policy, which I'm deemed to have accepted because I accepted the original one. Mm. I can't then opt out of the delta between the old policy and the new mm. policy and the bits of data that I gave you between then and then. I can't take it back. We're a big company. And, and That's what I'm scared we, of. We, we, <laughs> from that also comes that we have a, a great responsibility. And we're trying Spider -Man to... Spider-Man quotes, I love it. <laughs> but but, but I, 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 are you in the process of saying you agree? Is that what you're no, saying? No, I'm, 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 I'm trying to put this in a polite way. <laughs> 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 no, not... 
But my, my point is that we're trying to assume this responsibility because we are aware that we have a powerful position. But I, I don't like the argument that if you don't like us, you can leave, because I think we're bigger than that. Yeah. But there are options. I mean, if, 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 you, if you Google, for example, you always will have the possibility to Google without logging in, with, with, without uh, uh, anonymously, Google anonymously, search anonymously. So there are ways that you can exercise power to take charge of your situation. Now, that requires that you are active, and that's once again why I'm welcoming this, this discussion. But, but I'm, I wouldn't paint it as black and white as you are. I think no, we've, got, we've got lots of questions bubbling up in, on the floor. So I'll tell you what, we'll take, um, we'll take uh, two or three and, and then we'll try and tackle them all at once. Go on, sir. Hi, I'm uh, Jovan from Macedonia. Uh, there's uh, this long-term trust that was mentioned has a few dimensions as I see it. <laughs> I may make a decision because I like Sergey Brin and Larry Page. I think they're nice guys and I trust them. And I trust Google because until now, perhaps it, it looks like it's a good company. But what if, you know, Stephen Ballmer is all of a sudden taken as CEO next year and then the, the profile of the company changes? So there is one aspect of the trust that is uh, over, going over time. The second aspect is <laughs> there's companies, for instance, like Monsanto. They're not dealing in, in the business of, of IT, but they've been taking over con uh, companies that are uh, providing weather pattern data. Uh, and that have been collecting it for the past little while. And these are companies that have been collecting it on a, um, for, for different purposes. Now, Monsanto has taken it over, and it has proven that it is not a company to trust because it has taken over the seed market over the past 20 years uh, in many places of the earth. So now they have also uh, insight into the information on weather patterns. And as we see, you know, weather is becoming a, a key uh, element of our, our lives, how, and, and the next step is important. So the information that companies like this have gives them incredible power in the days ahead. And this is the kind of big data that is being collected by companies that, are on, that I'm not trusting from the, to begin with. So these are two, two things that I think should be addressed in some form, because it's not just like a Google question. This is a question for many companies that are collecting big data and the information and the power that gives them uh, in the years ahead. Okay. Uh, I'm tempted just to deal with that, because two quite complex points, and then move on to the more questions. So, but let, who wants to pick up on what the gentleman just said, both about the, the sort of the notion you ask for trust, and it's sort of you 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 paint it as 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 a, a lasting relationship. But you know your company can change, its leadership can change, its values can change over time, and one might argue Google's have over time. So that's one point. And the second point is, you know, <coughs> the the amount of data in, in hugely sensitive areas that you're collecting does give sort of private corporations worrying amounts of, of power and influence. Who, who um, again, Gus, do you want to say something well, on that? Yeah, um, sorry. Um, you used a great word in there, which is insight. And that is, uh, that's what these organizations are getting. They're getting insight, and I would go further and say they're getting intelligence. And I'm not trying to confuse it with the NSA debates, but there is something about intelligence, which is it's helping them it's not necessarily helping you. And with these arguments about moving on from consent, and there are good reasons to be discussing these things, but what they want, and I think what, what Bill's trying to promote is, oh, don't worry, we'll take the information, but we'll do good things with it, and there will be systems of regulation to make sure that we do good things with it. But you have to remember, going back to your first point, it's intelligence, and with intelligence comes power, and with power it means that they don't want to have to be held accountable. And then, so you can't escape the NSA debate. You can't escape the idea that Google can change what it says it's going to do with your information, as any company can do, because nobody's going to hold them to account, because too many other systems in, in society rely upon this information and this intelligence. But you can't turn back the clock. I mean, the, yeah. the capacity to develop this sort of big data-based intelligence is, in the end, a good thing, right? I mean, because it adds to the collective intelligence of the human species. But I don't so, think it so adds to the collective, first of all. And I still, like, for my sins, I, I'm an academic in the social sciences, and I still don't understand this idea that more data means smarter things will arise. 
I think that more data You don't means, believe that as a fundamental concept. I think most concept. examples in the society have shown that having more data doesn't mean you're smarter. Just because I have an Encyclopedia Britannica access on my, on my phone it doesn't means, make me a smarter Surely it means you have the potential person. to be smarter. I don't think so. Again, all the great studies on, let's use health, health research, all I mean, the great health research is done based on sampling, on very carefully designed statistical um, uh, methodologies. Well, this is, a, this is a really interesting sort of Versus, philosophical moment in this debate. Yeah, it, it's a very philosophical debate that isn't happening because industry just says, we want more data, we want more data. You speak to a statistician and they'll say, more data isn't the solution. It might help you sell better products to people. It might be useful for idiotic cases like what the advertising industry does, where making a mistake isn't the, the end of the world. Mm. But if we're talking about mission critical or life critical or just quality of life critical services based on big data, problems will naturally emerge. Uh, there was that 2008 article in Wired where there was this controversial comment about how with enough data, the numbers speak for themselves. Mm. And I think that that's a very dangerous point well, I, when yeah. you hit the point where the numbers are the value in themselves and where the embedded the, the, I mean, that, that, that's a sort of suggesting you get to a point with numbers where interpretation uh, yeah. and fine judgment isn't necessary. And I can't and imagine that. And you ignore that. the I mean, context. You ignore the very right. contested realities in which sure. data is collected and used. And you lose interpretation. But nonetheless, it's, you know, I, what I'm <coughs> picking up now is a very interesting idea that actually... <laughs> More and more and more big data in, in Gus's worldview is, is not, by definition, a, a, a potential addition to our collective wisdom at all. And I think the point has been made before that um, big data is one of those rare things where it's a problem not of scarcity but of abundance, where you actually have so much that it stops making sense. All right. You, where you, there's so you, much noise in the system yes. that the real value is very hard to find. David, you've been pulling all sorts of faces, point, yeah. suggesting you're not quite agreeing with what well, you're hearing at the moment. Uh, I do agree. Oh. oh <laughs> no, I don't. Um, <laughs> I, I do agree, however, that just buying the encyclopedia doesn't make you smarter. But the, but the, 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 the view I have of, of, of data-driven innovation is that we suddenly get the tools to truly understand what's in it. And that's where we get smarter. Now, we don't and exactly know what we're looking for. We don't know what kind of knowledge or what smartness we will acquire once we understand what's in those number of books. And that, that's kind of the, the scary beauty of it. But with the tools that we are given by the possibility to very quickly analyze the small cost, we will learn new stuff, mm. new things. Okay, uh, let's, uh, yes ma'am, you've been waiting patiently and then we'll come over there. My name is uh, We'll get you a microphone, don't, don't. There you go. Okay, my name is Jahan. I'm from Pakistan. Um, I think another angle to this debate that we should be looking at is all the people who collect data now, it's also hospitals, it's governments, it's banks, it's telcos, uh, and it is collected by any number of people, and we don't know how many people have access to that data and what they do with it. And in countries like ours, we know there is a lot of misuse of that data by individuals in those organizations. So I think that's something where privacy is, is affected a lot more right. than just Google or Facebook or... Okay. Well, the, I, it seems to me there's various issues. There's misuse. There's misuse. Uh, there's carelessness and sloppiness of yes. sort of data protection. And I, I witted on earlier because it just struck me as so shocking that eBay hadn't even bothered encrypting. Or, or the National Health Service, which uh, yeah. lost... All their data. Uh, which which national health service? <laughs> the UK Mine. National <laughs> so it's not only developing countries. No, where absolutely this is the not. No, you're dead right. I mean, the, the sloppiness, the carelessness, the abuses, they're, they're seen all over the world in you know, some of the quote unquote most developed societies, uh, not, not just in developing societies. Um, so, again, I mean, that, that just raises fundamental trust questions. You know, even if we believed in the, in the values and the the sort of collective goodwill of your ultimate CEO, you know, boss types, uh, we could still worry about uh, the way you store data and, and that threat to privacy and to our, our individual rights. Well, that, I mean, if, if, if you look at the negotiations in Brussels when it comes to data portability, it's going to become mandatory that you as a user are to be allowed to take your stuff with you and walk. I think that is a very 
good step forward for regulation. That is one of the sort of security measures we need to have in place. Um, I don't think that solves all of the problem if suddenly Steve Ballmer were no, to No, but often you only decide to walk Google. when it's too late, when you've, you've been faced with the fact that mm. the corporate or the state institution that you vested your data in has been exposed as being incompetent in, in its protection of the, you know. The, and the you don't know the 75 other companies who have got mm. the data, there are various uh, no, levels exactly. down the chain. No, you don't know you how far the chain has gone by the time data. you choose to walk. Yeah. And so this is why we have data protection law. Yeah. Yeah. But this is also why governments hate data protection law because it prevents them from selling uh, information they hold on you. So the NHS is quite annoyed that it can't sell health information to pharmaceutical companies. And this is also why, sorry to point fingers, but industry lobbies so hard against these laws because it gets in the way of these ever elusive innovations that's going to make the world a better place while mm. they profit from it. And so when Europe was renegotiating its data protection law, you had 4,000 amendments introduced, and they were all funded from industry and by government mm -hmm. because they didn't want anybody interfering with their potential to make money. Whereas where this entire problem starts, which is in the US, where there are companies who are promoting this idea that we need to be more liberal with the use of personal information, there is no law because Congress is dysfunctional. And so you have this, this problem where the lack of US legal framework is impacting the rest of the world where, and allows industry to go around to the rest of the world saying, don't pass laws, don't make things better, we want this innovation that's going to come. Yeah, but I think it's a little deeper. There's just a civil law and there's a common law difference. And so in the European model regime, right, you've got a long list of things you can do, right? And then in the US, you're told when you've screwed up, right? So that's probably painting in two broad strokes. But I think from a commercial incentive, this notion of being able to discover new insights new actions, whether that's commercial good or for the good of the common individual, whatever. If we proactively and prescriptively say, these are the end number of things that these bits can be used, this is the only way this algorithm works, you know, that will be a trade issue, right? So in the whole, you know, there's a variety of different perspectives on the surveillance work. But from my perspective, where there was some material conversations that happened was when surveillance turned into trade. And so I think a lot of the incentives of where the EUDP regulations are evolving is recognizing that this balance is, is tricky and it's contextually driven and we need to have those types of policies in place that both protect and enable. And I know that's... But the thing that industry is most annoyed by at, at, at with, within the EU reforms was oh my God, we'd have to notify people if it's a data breach. How, how dare you impose upon us this, this duty to notify in case there's data breach and then all of the European Parliament says, yeah, it, it does sound quite onerous. And then eBay happens. And then all of a sudden, the wisdom appears. Completely understood. I mean, this is a, a complex issue, and there's multiple elements. I think in general, though, striking a more sustainable balance versus largely looking at rules that were written 30 years ago and making an incremental update is not going to work for the next 30. I'm going to stop you there, because I, I, I just want to bring, bring in as many people as I can. Let's take two over here, the lady and then the gentleman here. Well, we can start either way. Uh, the ladies, right there. Well, okay, gentlemen first, then lady. Yep, go on. Thank you. Morning. Yep. Hi, uh, I'm Eduardo Bertoni from Argentina. Uh, I would like to ask. Try Hello. That one. Yeah, yep. that's better. Uh, I'm Eduardo Bertoni. I'm a law professor in, in Argentina. I would like to ask Gus first a concrete question and then see the, the response mm -hmm. coming from Google, from David. Uh, Gus, what is exactly, I mean, I, I would like to leave this, this panel, this meeting, having a concrete idea, okay? What is exactly you, you want to see in the companies like Google in relation to collecting data? Is your proposal to have some sort of regulation saying you cannot collect data? Is your proposal to say, is, is your proposal to say, okay, we want to have regulations to say what the companies can do and cannot do with the data? This is, and if that is the case, I jump to David. I mean, can a company like Google or others can survive, for example, without collecting data? Because I, I'm a little bit confused. I don't know if you want to say the companies cannot collect data at all, if you want to say that companies can collect data for specific purposes and they, want, and they have to be transparent, and this is something that Google is trying to do as far as we understand. But if you want to see a regulation saying 
concrete things that Google can do with the data. What are those those things? Very in a very practical and concrete way. All right. Thank you. We have, we'll come to you next, but we'll deal with that very quickly. Then we'll come to you, Gus. What what specifically concrete terms is your message uh, to Google about big data collection? I want them to have to follow a system of rules, and I want them to be held accountable to those systems of rules. And, and who and makes the rules? I mean, Google's a global company. So Google can make it, but within the fabric of law, and where there is something that that is particularly outside the fabric of the law, you want the individual's involvement. You want consent. So I'm not saying Google shouldn't collect information. By all means, I would never say that. I w and I, again, I don't think Google is the worst actor in this field, because we at least know we're interacting with Google some of the time. Actually, we don't realize that we're interacting with Google all of the time. <laughs> um, but still, at least you know Google exists. There are companies out there you don't know exist, and yet they have your information. So I want the individual to know when that information's there, but I also, even if I don't know if my information's with the company, I want that company to be bound to a system of rules. What we have instead is companies gathering information. I don't know who they are. They're doing things with that information. I don't but, know what they're doing. But these are national rules, international rules? I, I think we need international rules. Like we, There's a... a a global consensus to, um, like there's 100 countries with data protection laws. The US is often, God knows where, uh, because of Congress being incapable of passing law in this domain. Even Obama wants laws in this domain. But, um, so there is a general consensus that you can apply a system of rules to this. Well, yeah, you said, but as soon as you start talking about international uh, rules and laws, it seems to me you are just making uh, a rod for your own back. You're talking about years and years and years and years and years of talking shops and panels and UN committees, and nothing will ever actually get done. I mean, because you might as well just say, look at the UN as a whole. Do we have, do we have a successful international sort of political geostrategic uh, governance system? No, of course we don't. It's totally dysfunctional. It doesn't work. Why would it work for setting rules for the internet or the collection of big data, it won't work internationally. It'll end up being, you know, the Chinese want to do it this way, the Russians this way, the Indians this way. It the only reason work. it doesn't work now is because there's a big black hole in the entire legal system, and that is the U.S. The U.S. knows this. Everybody knows this. That isn't this. the only reason it doesn't work. Yeah, like, who's transacting with Chinese companies? No, we don't, because we think we don't want our information going there, but we don't have the choice about uh, information ending up in the U.S., and any reasonable country would pass rules about this. The White House wants to pass rules about this, but they're just so dysfunctional in the U.S., whether it's at a congressional level or the lobbying by companies who don't want any rules interfering with them profiting. All right, and, and just very briefly, because I want to get to the lady here. Uh, David, the, the question for you, knocking on from that, was w could Google survive if it wasn't able to, you know... Innovate? ...mine big data? Um, I think we could survive, but I don't think the services would be as good. Yeah. If you want a short answer. No, I do, and I'm grateful for it. Man. <laughs> I uh, don't know if that microphone's working, sorry. Give it, give, can we get you the other microphone or a different microphone? Just bear with us. There you go. Try that one. Um, no, you can hear me? Yeah. Speak as loud as you can, really close to the mic. Uh, um, uh, my question was about the need of international legal instrument because we, don't, we shouldn't be expecting people to control their data. It's uh, simply not realistic. One citizen is registered from... 150 to 1,000 and even more databases. So, I mean, you can imagine how much time we will need to control um, where our data goes and flows. So, what what could be the legal tools, at least legal tools, and then we should probably think about the implementation of that legal tools, the global legal tools to use to protect the privacy. At, at the same time, keep the balance between freedom of information, which is also very important. Um, uh, important um, tool and important for our the, the daily lives. Thank so, you. So, yeah, um, I'll, I'll again say th the tool exists, which is data protection. And let me be uh, a little bit more comprehensive for a second. I think we agree on 95% of the rules around data protection. And I think... We, who's we? The people on this panel. Oh, I thought you meant... Except some of our countries don't have them. Y you're working on it. Right. I'm optimistic but about that. But we still that. don't have it, yeah. Um, 
there is agreement and it can happen and it wouldn't re require a UN convention or anything like that. Where the disagreement is, is in the last 5%. Whether Google can do additional things with your information or um, which, what I think is an even more radical idea, which is to abandon any controls over uh, collection and focus just on how information is used. I think that's quite a radical, interesting and debatable, but it is a radical well, concept. Well, it was nuanced too, so it wasn't to throw out protections. You're right, you're sorry. So this is about to drive new values and insight. Simply monitoring the bits is like monitoring the carbon atoms in your body. It just ain't gonna work. There's too many bits. We have stopped counting, literally. I mean, yotabytes. It's, it's post-numerate, right? And so the focus on the data will ultimately be <laughs> You know, pick your favorite metaphor, but it, it won't be that effective. As opposed to identifying a context, identifying what that impact is, having measurements in place, identifying what the probability is that this either will or won't happen, and then what are the mitigating steps to address that particular impact. And that we stop solving the problem and focus on one problem day at a time and collectively the norms, the values, the principles, the legal instruments will emerge. This is an emerging phenomenon. And I think we're all in a bit of a kind of phase change where we just simply can't understand the dynamics of the system. Mm. It is unknowable. Answering the question, who has your data, where is your data, are unanswerable questions. But that's right now in 2014. Imagine what it's going to be like in 2020 or it, it'll 2030. It'll be the same. So that, that is to my larger point of in terms of a technological innovation and in, in the beginnings of how we start to enable the auditing is we need more bits about bits. And so the providence, the permissions, the ways that certain data types can be used for certain classes of, of uses, and you're starting to see this in certain uh, health fields, that I think is the beginnings of where we might be able to see some light. And I think what's also interesting in the health space is they have governance models, right? So they have IRBs where the ethics, the business models, the medical procedures, the science, all are collectively understanding what this particular trial is and I think there's some insights there, and that might be a mechanism to scale to get us back to what I'll call, this is a bit of a buzzword, but this kind of multi-stakeholder governance element. Oh, as soon as I heard you like that? the new ism <laughs> of multi-stakeholderism this morning, I, I almost choked on my coffee, so let's not go there again. Um, Ma'am, let's have you, your question, and then uh, where will we go next? We'll go to the lady in red at the back. Okay, can I start? Yeah, go on. Well, I'm academic, I'm from Poland, and I have uh, too many questions, but I just uh, focus on two. Well, we only want one at the moment, because we're running okay. a bit short of time. For, first, to the Google blog, sorry for using the term. Google blog, yeah. <laughs> but um, you said that uh, big data is necessary for innovation. I agree. I'm also a computer scientist. But I also know, because of my mm, job, that for innovation, you don't need personal data you need mostly statistical data. And how you can ensure me that even if I'm not locked in, you don't try to connect anonymous data collected from my IP address or my computer with my personal data, which you have having a big data, for example, from telecom company or this kind of thing. This is the first question. And the second question, I'm also a lawyer, it happens, and uh, you asked about the um, solution, legal solutions. And my question is different. For example, we, we cannot speak about the global local solutions uh, till the moment that every, every nation, every country all over the world will uh, have the same solution. Otherwise, it doesn't work. But for example, we, at least in the European Union, uh, and also some um, parts of the world outside the European Union, agreed that you can gather informa personal information only with implicit, explicit, sorry, uh, consent of the data subject. So can you show with personal data you uh, gathering and um, uh, doing th different things, you can show personal uh, content for collecting personal data, not content given to someone else, to the telecom company for, for using Google or whatever, but my, for example, my content for using my data by Google, if I'm not logged in and you know it and I know it, that you can, uh, that you can uh, combine anonymous data with personal data taken from IP owner or whatever. Mm. 
Okay, uh, let's just take another thought from the back here. Go on. Yeah, um, I just like I feel like now that the sentiment is not necessarily that big data is the devil, but it's mostly the, the person that owns or controls the, the big data. And there's been certain cases that big, the use of big data, even by the same companies like Google, has, has been done uh, for good purposes, like you know predicting outbreaks of certain diseases. Sure. Or so the question is here: um, if big data can be useful uh, and can be used for good purposes, what kind of measures uh, should be taken or can be affected that can um, help us sort of get the best of both worlds where our privacy is not uh, affected, but at the same time you get the benefits of it. And who can be the, 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 the people that basically are the stakeholders that affect it? And the third thing is that if we're going, if we're going after the people that are controlling the big data, should we go uh, after somebody like Nielsen, for instance, that has a lot of information as well, a lot of data about people and they keep recycling it? Is the internet here the factor that makes the difference or is it the concept of having data about people? Mm. You guys do ask incredibly complex, multi-tiered questions. So that <laughs> after a couple of them, my, my head's spinning. But, but uh, for, for Google bloke, uh, from Poland, we had this point. I think we've sort of touched on it before, but you know, you may say that uh, what you're doing is anonymized, but it's easy to marry what you, you know, information that you are uh, taking, match it up with information from other sources, which we talked about earlier, and the anonymity factor is immediately eroded, and, and people who are aware of your promise to keep things anonymous or whatever don't realize that actually those dots can be joined up very easily. So is the question, how can we be sure that Google holds its promises? It's and, and, I think and, and it I mean, gets I, I, pretty I, much I, back to that, yeah. I, I would argue that we are to be held accountable. I mean, the, the, my guess is that eBay will now be held accountable pretty bad for a while. And, and that is the way it works. Every time there has been a debate about Google and privacy, we have been held accountable. And it has led to, to us taking it extremely seriously and trying to do it even better than we did before. So at least we ourselves see ourselves as being held accountable to hold our promises. I'm not sure if that is a response that, that, that satisfies you, but, but at least that is our perspective. We are accountable for our promises. Yeah. Um, and the second one, very briefly, because uh, there's no point asking questions if we don't at least briefly kick them around, uh, was, you know, clearly there are benefits from some specific uses of big data, but ha ha what's the best way of ensuring that we get the best benefits? If I could just, um, she was uh, pointing to the example of Google flu trends. That is, uh, in two 2010, it was discovered that uh, if you analyze the Google searches, you could identify the outbreak of flu. And so that's used as the example of how big data is so wonderful. The fact of the matter is, uh, about two months ago, a paper was written to show that that model's broken. It was debunked. So, wasn't exactly. It? Yeah. So it's an example of how big data isn't the solution to all problems. But going to your, your bigger point, uh, and it comes back to what Bill was saying before, is there a way of deciding about the good uses of big data? And there is, in that we could set up a review board that says, this is for the betterment of, of humanity. This can happen. You can do it. The problem is, again, it's all... It, it's all information being processed and you can't see it. So you have to trust that this is actually happening and lo and behold, the NSA is gonna be doing big data all the time without asking anybody and without being governed. I think mm. there's another dimension to it as well when you're making these trade-offs so against societal good. I think it, there's a sort of parallax error is the only way I can think of it where you are asked to make a trade-off of your individual privacy versus societal good. There's a sort of mismatch that often happens. You, you might, may not necessarily benefit, but you're giving something up. And that's a very finely grained analysis that you can't really make when you don't have all the right information. You're being asked to give something up for some hypothetical benefit that you may or may not get. But you can't, but it, it's a very difficult thing to argue against because people will say, well, don't you want society to benefit? And, you know, they, they set up all these straw men. That's very hard to combat. But I think recognizing that that trade off isn't always an equal one uh, is, is important in the debate. All right, I want to squeeze two more questions in. Um, yeah, yeah, I know you, you've been trying for a long time, and I suspect there's probably one more. So we'll get one microphone down here, and who else would like the privilege of asking the last question? Oh, goodness, that's... Oh, good. I thought, well, have you had one already, sir? No? Oh, good. You okay, can have one. Um, Go on. I, I was waiting long enough so that most of my questions got answered, <laughs> but I still have one, one short one that, that I believe is, is very important. Go on. Why is big data econo economically viable? And will it stay Why is it viable? Economically viable, yes. Yeah. And will it, will it stay so when, when we have 
lots of companies with with abundance of information, not only data, and analyze data and organize data into information and, mm. and even even knowledge. Uh, will it stay economically viable to right. companies, or will we be going to yet another way of benefiting from our right. uh, knowledge and information? In a way, you're saying, um, are you saying maybe big data is a fad, a fashion? You know, we, we, we've assumed it's very useful and therefore economically has value, but maybe we'll grow out of that. Maybe. maybe. What, what do we think? Well, we don't know yet, do we? But I think if we were to, uh, if we were to, to have a review board that, that sort of approved big data projects on, be, on beforehand, then I think we definitely would kill all of the possibilities <laughs> of, of, of big data or data-driven innovation actually delivering something. You mean you don't want a review board telling Google what it can do with big data? Not, not necessarily Google, but I think if you have a review board which tells innovators what they can do and what cannot do on beforehand, then you will kill a lot of creativity. No, I, I, I'm sort of inclined to be a little skeptical of review boards myself, but yeah. I guess you're... Well, I was... <laughs> let me put a little nuance. It wasn't on the discovery phase, right? It's when you go from discovery to action. And when those actions had a societal harm, right, then there's certain mechanisms. We have policies in place that start to vet that. But by no means do you have a checklist of telling some data scientist what he can learn and discover. I think absolutely it's, it has to find its appropriate place in the value chain. Okay. And so I promised you the last question, so go for it. Uh, thank you very much. Torbjörn Fredriksson from Ankted. Um, uh, I'll pick up on what Gus said. Um, you mentioned that data protection is the answer, sort of, data protection laws. Um, now, and at the same time, you said that uh, we're never going to find out where the data are. Now, if all the uh, data protection laws are primarily national in character, and we go into the cloud and we have difficulties knowing where the data are, how do we know which jurisdiction will apply to the protection of our data? Excellent question. <laughs> um, and I'd say the jurisdiction that should apply is your own. Um, and so you have a national regulator in your jurisdiction who is there to protect your rights, and companies that operate in that jurisdiction should have to abide by the laws. If companies operate in other jurisdictions, th th they're that is the problem, but then all jurisdictions should have equivalent laws, and the only jurisdiction that's left out of that is the United States. But it, it's, it's, I mean, it, it's a sort of virtual jurisdiction. You know, if you're talking about activities in the cloud, uh, how do you pin down where legal responsibility is located there? Yeah, and that's the exact same black hole that the NSA used in order to go after the data on the black cloud. We can solve these problems. It's just there is an institutional resistance against solving these problems because there's so much money to be made and so much surveillance to be done. Right. I'm going to end just with a... I, I, I'm a bit addicted to straw polls. They mean absolutely nothing, but they satisfy my curiosity. Um, like big data. Uh, <laughs> at the end of this debate, and, and I do think... I do thank the panel for really chewing over fascinating sort of aspects of this whole big data debate. At the end of this discussion we've had, who feels uh, essentially positive about the fact that we all believe we're going to see more and more um, big data collected and used, uh, you know, across the world in all of our lives? Uh, who feels positive that it is actually going to have a beneficial effect for all of us? Okay, and who actually feels skeptical, worried, concerned about the direction in which it's going? More passionate, because two hands are going out from one individual, and, it, <laughs> and he's waving them, so I think that, that's a signal he's very, very worried. Um, probably a few more worried than, than feeling positive, but I'm not sure that tells us anything at all, except that perhaps you guys are inclined to be concerned about the future of... No, this is little data. This is uh, very anecdotal data. Um, Sample um, bias as well. Yeah. But listen, uh, thanks so much for listening to all of us. And thank you for your questions, which were fantastic. Thanks to the panel. Thank you very much. Yeah.